your your choice is I'm going to just sit here and try to work with the regulators to obstruct any innovation in the US. And in, in which case, by the way, it gets pushed abroad and then the UK will do stuff in Canada and Switzerland and Dubai and everything. Else. Or are you going to say, I got to start investing in this? And if you do invest in it, then you go to the regulators and you go, we need some clarity because we're making big capital investments and we need to understand where you come out on this stuff. Welcome to Bankless, where we explore the frontier of internet money and internet finance. This is how to get started, how to get better, and how to front run the opportunity. This is Ryan Sean Adams. I'm here with David Hoffman, and we're here to help you become more bankless. The institutions are still bullish. Notice the emphasis of the word still. <laughs> Eric Peters is our guest today. He operates one of the largest institutional crypto hedge funds in the world. Maybe an institutional hedge fund you haven't heard of, because Eric Peters is not super loud on crypto, yet... This is one of the biggest funds in its space. Our question to him today was, what do the institutions think of this crypto asset class, particularly after the crazy year 2022 we just had? Are they running for the hills? A few things to look out for. Number one, how did Eric avoid Luna and FTX? What does he think happened to Three Hours Capital, a hedge fund that went completely bust? What smelled off to him about Sam Bankman Freed? Number two, why Eric thinks shorting narcissism is actually the winning strategy. Maybe the thing people didn't do in 2022. Number three, regulation in the space. What should we do? What should the regulators do? How should we address this? And number four, Eric ends with a story about his fight with a bunch of CIO billionaires over dinner and what he told them about macro. David, there's some deep insights in this episode about investment, about crypto. Overall, I was pretty blown away with the way uh, Eric and his fund have kind of grown in understanding of this asset uh, class and of crypto. What were some of the things people should look for in this episode? I think the important thing to note the most is the difference in disposition between Eric as an investor, as an institutional investor, versus some of the gunslinging Wild West capital allocators that you find in the crypto natives. Uh, there is a personality difference between these two ty types of archetypes, these two types of uh, investors in crypto, because now they're in the same spot. Institutions are here. They've been here for a while. And Eric is is uh, uh, an archetype of the institutional uh, money allocator. And the disposition of these types of people are very different from the types of people that you see on crypto Twitter. Uh, Pay attention to those differences uh, and how the, the word cadence comes up and the dis investment decisions. And I think really over time, the crypto asset industry will mature and start to look a little bit more like the institutional investors that we see today because the institutional investors of the TradFi world, they are built with guardrails, with, with rules, with perhaps with more patience as to when to allocate capital. And I think as the crypto industry matures, it start, it's going to start to look like that. And so as the crypto industry develops and matures, it's going to stop looking a lot like a lot less like the Wild West and start to look a little bit like what Eric is doing over at One River Asset Management. And so understanding these differences, the, the is ought gap, uh, I think is important. And Eric just gives age old wisdom that's always going to be true, no matter what the asset class is or no matter what decade it is. And so understanding these perspectives, a, a perhaps a more mature investment philosophy, I think is going to behoove you as an investor, even while we still remain on the frontier. It's also going to behoove you to stick around after the episode. If you're a premium subscriber, tap into the debrief. That is where David and I give our raw thoughts after the episode. Got a lot to talk to you about uh, with respect to institutional investors and Eric's temperament, all sorts of things. Also, of course, there are 100 editions of this episode that will be available on the day this episode is released. That is Monday. So you can pick up an NFT copy of this episode as well. It's something that we started in 2023. Build your collection of bankless episodes. There'll be a link in the show notes for that too. Guys, we're going to get right to the episode with Eric. But before we do, we want to tell you about the sponsors that made this episode possible. In particular, we want to tell you about Kraken, which is our number one recommended crypto exchange for 2023. Kraken has been a leader in the crypto industry for the last 12 years. Dedicated to accelerating the global adoption of crypto, Kraken puts an emphasis on security, transparency, and client support, which is why over 9 million clients have come to love Kraken's products. Whether you're a beginner or a pro, the Kraken UX is simple, intuitive, and frictionless, making the Kraken app a great place for all to get involved and learn about crypto. For those with experience, the 
redesigned Kraken Pro app and web experience is completely customizable to your trading needs, integrating key trading features into one seamless interface. Kraken has a 24-7, 365 client support team that is globally recognized. Kraken support is available wherever, whenever you need them, by phone, chat, or email. And for all of you NFTers out there, the brand new Kraken NFT beta platform gives you the best NFT trading experience possible. Rarity rankings, no gas fees, and the ability to buy an NFT straight with cash. Does your crypto exchange prioritize its customers the way that Kraken does? And if not, sign up with Kraken at kraken.com slash bankless. Arbitrum One is pioneering the world of secure Ethereum scalability and is continuing to accelerate the Web3 landscape. Hundreds of projects have already deployed on Arbitrum One, producing flourishing DeFi and NFT ecosystems. With the recent addition of Arbitrum Nova, gaming and social dApps like Reddit are also now calling Arbitrum home. Both Arbitrum One and Nova leverage the security and decentralization of Ethereum and provide a builder experience that's intuitive, familiar, and fully EVM compatible. On Arbitrum, both builders and users will experience faster transaction speeds with significantly lower gas fees. With Arbitrum's recent migration to Arbitrum Nitro, it's also now 10 times faster than before. Visit Arbitrum.io where you can join the community, dive into the developer docs, bridge your assets, and start building your first dApp. With Arbitrum, experience Web3 development the way it was meant to be. Secure, fast, cheap, and friction-free. Uniswap is the largest on-chain marketplace for self-custody digital assets. Uniswap is, of course, a decentralized exchange, but you know this because you've been listening to Bankless. But did you know that the Uniswap web app has a shiny new fiat on-ramp? Now you could go directly from fiat in your bank to tokens in DeFi inside of Uniswap. Not only that, but Polygon, Arbitrum, and Optimism Layer 2s are supported right out of the gate. But that's just DeFi. Uniswap is also an NFT aggregator, letting you find more listings for the best prices across the NFT world. With Uniswap, you can sweep floors on multiple NFTs and Uniswap's universal router will optimize your gas fees for you. Uniswap is making it as easy as possible to go from bank account to bankless assets across Ethereum. And we couldn't be more thankful for having them as a sponsor. So go to app.uniswap.org today to buy, sell, or swap tokens and NFTs. Bankless Nation, excited to introduce you to, once again, Eric Peters. He's the founder CIO of One River Asset Management. His fund has made some of the largest institutional investments in crypto ever. I'm talking hundreds of millions of dollars of purchases of ETH and Bitcoin. One, I think, was like 600 million, something like that. Good memory. Really big yeah. numbers. Uh, and when I think institutional crypto, when David and I do, we always think of Eric. Uh, last we chatted was October 2021. So a lot has happened since that time, Bankless Nation. So we brought Eric on to catch up about all things <laughs> crypto. Simpler, simpler times back then. Simpler times. Eric, welcome back to Bankless. Uh, how are things in Greenwich? <laughs> <laughs> Not Greenwich. Um, it's great to be back. And, uh, and yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I really enjoyed that first discussion that we had. And uh, uh, it seems like other people have as well. Um, uh, that that faux pas, the, the Greenwich faux pas, seems to have uh, circled the world here. It seems, it seems to have lived in infamy. I can't seem to yeah. shake that one. But you know what? That was a great episode where I feel like um, you taught some of the crypto people about how institutions think. Uh, and uh, I mean, we can't even pronounce uh, the names of, of the cities of some of the largest, you know, where the largest hedge funds in the world are educated. So it's clearly crypto I think we need some context, educated. Brian. Can you, can you get the, the okay, new Bankless so listeners who haven't tapped New Bankless new, listeners, yeah. if you don't remember, our original episode in October 2021, I said something in the beginning uh, to Eric, like, uh, it's great to talk to you all the way in Greenwich, Connecticut. Uh, that is, of course, not how Greenwich is pronounced. <laughs> And uh, I've since learned that. I remember that. when you said that, it, it <laughs> triggered an alarm bell in my head, but I'm like, You're like oh, Ryan's pretty uh, smart. He, he probably knows what he's talking about. <laughs> Ryan ride. knows things. Let it ride. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, it, it was a perfect metaphor because I think, I think uh, I'm obviously, you know, uh, many, many years older than you guys. But I, I think that our, our position in this industry really is kind of a, a bridge to traditional, more traditional finance and crypto. Yeah. And uh, Greenwich is a pretty good place for, it was just, you know, look, for doing that. It yeah, was, it was so. the perfect intro. I was right. just trying to make yeah. an analogy in the intro, you know? It was, yeah, uh, no, it was totally a great set. Intentional. Perfect, classic, yeah. Um, well, okay, let's talk about what's happened since October 21. So that was a very heady time for crypto. Mm -hmm. uh, numbers had gone up quite a bit. Um, let me just ask you your perspective on this. Of course, we're in a different market right now at the beginning of, of 2023. 
Are you still bullish on this investment class, Eric? Yeah, sure. Um, it's uh, look, we've we've had a, we've had a big cycle, and um, we've had the big down cycle, and I think. You know, when I, when I think about markets just in general terms, after having um, been a macro trader for a long, long time, I tend to think in terms of there's a certain cadence to markets, bull markets and bear markets. And when we last spoke, we were, you know, still very much in a in a uh, an aggressive bull market. Um, we had not seen Fed tightening. We had not seen quantitative tightening. Um, it was extremely unclear how committed the Fed would be to tightening financial conditions. And so, um, you know, those were those were very heady days uh, for this industry. But what you saw, you saw a lot of the types of behaviors that you would tend to see in a, you know, a very aggressive uh, bull market. And, um, you know, I think we we, um, you know, touch wood, um, we have been. Conservative. It's hard to say you're conservative if you've invested six hundred million dollars in Bitcoin ETH, right? But I mean, we were broadly speaking, you know, relative to the industry, and then we've taken a pretty conservative uh, stance there, and that that has served us well. In that we exited, you know, almost all of our risk in in twenty one, that early risk, um, which was you know, in return that capital, and so. You know, and then on on this on this decline, um, I I didn't expect it to be as as deep as it was, um, but I didn't really expect the Fed to have moved as aggressively as it did um, either. And so, I think now that we we you know we have seen the large really the largest or most aggressive certainly one of the largest most aggressive uh, tightening cycles in in U.S. monetary history. We've seen that over the this past year, and you know there's another small rate hike today and we're clearly kind of coming toward the end of this there's not going to be another huge rate hike cycle and so now we're you know we're in that part we're in that phase where you know we can list all the different blow ups that have happened and, and you guys certainly have in your on your previous podcast those are all you know really well known um but i'd say you know even as recently as just the beginning of this year we were at a place where i would have rated crypto as the top top 3 most most kind of bearish markets from a pure capitulation sentiment standpoint that I've seen in my in my career, and I've seen some I've seen some horrible washouts. But you know, there were people who actually who I who I respect who were saying Bitcoin could go negative. And you know, like when you get to that stage, we're we're now at a place where cadence wise, you know, maybe some good things could happen. I, I'm extremely bullish for um, for the the medium to long term, and we'll we'll talk about that. You know, I'm sure over the course of, of of this time, but but you know that's the kind of the long answer is yes, I, I am. Uh, you know, I'm grateful that we've we've kind of navigated this bear market, and it's really kind of a quasi 1929 market crash environment. I, I'm grateful as a firm and for our investors that we've kind of navigated well. Um, we're also developing, you know, behind the scenes into it, and and I'm I, I think um, I think that this next phase, I don't know when it will begin, and maybe it already has started. By the way. But uh, I think this next phase will, will be very powerful because it actually will finally have real institutional uh, adoption, not just in the investments, but also kind of the technologies. And I, I think that's a big deal. So many questions about this. So it's one mm. question, though, is the sentiment you said was one of the first, from one of the worst uh, three that you've ever seen. What are some of the others that are like comparable to this? I should have added, I can't even remember the other top two. Like it was just, <laughs> it, I mean, it, it literally was... You know, it was that bad. But if if I were to if I were to think about um, if I were to think about certain times, like for instance, I was trading um, in in the '90s. I was trading uh, the Deutschmark, which you guys don't even you know. I don't know. You don't even remember that there was one, probably yeah, right? Sure, yeah, sure. It, the Deutschmark versus um, the Italian lira, for instance, and. Um, you know, that was a time when it blew out of the exchange rate mechanism. That was when George Soros made his his uh, billion dollars in a day. He, you know, he was betting on sterling, but I was um, I was betting on against Italy. And when it finally blew out, it basically the Italian lira got really weak and you knew that that was going to create a ton of inflation and uh, which, it, you know, there's a big translation economy like that. Once the currency gets really weak, the bond yields jump. Everyone worries about a default. Inflation picks up, capital flees, and there was a general sentiment that the Italian lira could literally just just shift into absolute hyperinflation. 
And by the way, I was I was kind of caught up in that as well. I was I was in the right position had it not been for um, a really uh, 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 you know my boss who had great advice. We had a we had a big client who actually wanted to um, wanted to sell a, just a ton of of lira, and I was real you know I I could see that reflexive uh, dynamic that could have just propelled it to just you know kind of becoming one of those stories of of history where currency just goes to kind of zero. Um, but thank you know I, I was kind of lucked out of getting out of that position um, with with a client. Um, but I just, but that's why it's like, it's, that's just so clear in my memory of just how negative everyone was to the point that I was so negative that the only way I got out was because it was luck. I mean, really. Um, but there, you know, there are times like that where, you know, in 08 in, you know, when, when the S and P got, or it was in 09, but when they got, when it got to 666 on the S and P, you know, it had come off so far, but you know, like people still thought, well, we don't know what's going on. It could go, you know, why couldn't it fall another 50%? And why couldn't it fall another twenty five percent? And and so you you know you have those types of markets where sentiment is just so horrific. And I think in crypto, um, I think the FTX thing was just catastrophic from a sentiment perspective. And so a- anyone who held any kind of hope that maybe this was primarily due to over leverage and primarily due to uh, this tightening cycle, I think that they just capitulated post FTX are like, oh my God. And, and understandably, you know, well, well th- this is why so much we wanted to have you on, right? It's because of this negative sentiment, uh, Eric. And so, I mean, I think for, for some crypto na- natives that have been through previous cycles, I mean, like, you know, 2017, 2018 bear cycle, ETH lost 95% of its value. That mm-hmm. was pretty brutal. And there have been cycles before this, right? All the way back to you talk to people like Eric Voorhees, Mount Gox, pretty brutal negative sentiment cycles. But this one hit in a in kind of a different way, like a sentiment way. Reason Part of the reason we wanted to, to catch up with you, Eric, is because I feel like this one hit maybe the institutional investor narrative in some specific way. And w- what I mean is this like, um, this exchange, top three crypto exchange, uh, sort of a, um, you know, multi-billion dollar, you know, biggest billionaire, in, in, in history under the age of 30 with a successful exchange and a fund and some parents credibility. At Stanford. The parents at Stanford and credibility mm-hmm. in, the, in the halls of uh, Congress and our governments. And I, I assume some credibility on Wall Street, this sorts of things. It turned out the whole thing was a fraud. Like, and I, you know, I know there's legal definition of the word fraud, but I think we can safely say like this whole thing was like a fraud. And, um, Crypto natives are used to these kind of like bear markets, but I was curious about the institutional sentiment. Like, are the institutions just looking at this and saying, my God, what a mess. These people are not professional. These people don't know what they're doing. We are getting the hell out of here. Has it scared the institutions away? And uh, yeah, what was your reaction to all of this? Like, I was surprising for us was it surprising for you? And what has been the blowback specifically for the institutional investors in crypto? Um, so a few things. Was it surprising? I think the fact that it was that FTX was a fraud at the scale that uh, that it was was surprising to me. Um, we, but but I think there were there were warning signs, um, and, uh, and incidentally, we, we had no exposure to FTX. We never did business with them. They didn't pass our operational due diligence for a variety of reasons. Um, we didn't invest in FTT. We excluded it from our index. So I think that- D- Did you consider it? Yeah, because it's, you know, we, we had to. Um, you know, when, mm. when we build an index, it's, it's built around a, a variety of objective rules. And so- um, Thankfully, those rules had ruled out both Luna and FTT, um, and so, you know, I think that I think that there. <clears throat> so I didn't know that it, that uh, FTX was a fraud. I found a number of things really interesting. Um, you know, in in uh, a conference shortly before it happened, I knew that they were trying to raise a billion dollars, and and yet, um, you know, Sam was speaking publicly. That he was intending to potentially give a billion dollars to um, to uh, politicians over the next cycle, and he explained that he was looking to raise a billion dollars because he was going to do big acquisitions, which 
you know, kind of coyly hinted could be something like Coinbase, which I thought was, you know, lacked lacked any kind of credibility whatsoever. And uh, and so, you know, I, I think that um, I, I I haven't like I don't really know Silicon Valley, but I know that some young people go to Silicon Valley and they make extraordinary amounts of money in a very short period of time if they built an app or a firm or a Facebook or this or that. But I do know finance very well. And I haven't seen a 29 year old make the kind of money that um, that he supposedly had. And it didn't. But even so, I, you know, my view was that's that's just not a firm that we need to to be associated with because I just don't understand it. I, it's it's I you know I'm not going to suggest that it's a fraud or he's doing anything illegal or any. I just I just didn't understand. So something it. And, smelled off to you. Well, it, well, it it is. I mean, you just if you could, you know, I'd love you to list the the top, you know five guys or, or one guy in finance who's made, you know, whatever it was, 15 or $20 billion by the time he's 29. You're like, there isn't a, it's, it's not like there's a long list. There just is no, there's no, it's just, a, you don't, you don't find that. So I think that, um, I think institutions, by the way, were, were broadly speaking shocked. Um, I was very surprised. Um, it made sense to me that something hadn't been right. That made sense. But I, I thought it probably was something else as opposed to just a fraud. I think institutions, um, you know, it was deeply unsettling to them. Obviously, there'd been a bunch of venture capital investors who had made significant commitments, and that's got to be unsettling. It's not necessarily a, a strong indictment against them. I don't really know venture investing. So my understanding is, you know, you need to spread investments around. And, um, it, and if, if every, if basically if everything that, if all of your due diligence was perfectly knowable, there would be no opportunity. So the, the question is, you know, kind of what, where do you, what do you give a pass to? And so, so I, anyway, I, I think institutions just across the board were pretty unsettled by that. Definitely the fact that you met with so many politicians, regulators, et cetera, um, was was unsettling. He's had spoken at every conference that you could imagine. So you know it's such a high profile that it is unsettling. That said, um, you, you know from from our perspective, we you know we have not suffered from lack of um, of inquiry about this space because it, when you think about an institution, it's like okay, just think about kind of the game theory around this, which is not what investing is entirely about, but there's an element to that, right? So let's say you're, let's say you're the firm, the institution that was deeply, deeply skeptical at the highest level about crypto. And then this happens. It's a high likelihood that you're just going to go, see, I told you so. This was just all a Ponzi and, and fraud and everything. And you're just not going to do anything. That's probably what happens to that institution. It, there are not that many institutions where there was such high conviction at the top, most of them were more nuanced. So you probably have a bunch of young people in the investment committee who said, look, I think there are a lot of really interesting applications for these technologies. I think it's the future. I think we we don't need to make a 10% commitment to it, but we should probably have 50 basis points or 100 basis points or 150. And so when we should do that. And so let's say you're that institution and the senior people are like, it just feels very heady in 2021. And I think we're gonna have a rate hike cycle but let's keep doing the work, which they did. And now you get to 2022 or 2023 and the market's crashed, okay? You, now you can do one of two things. You can say, you know what? We were a little skeptical and now we know that this is worthless. And so now we're not gonna touch it. There's significant risk for an investor because if you, if, if you think that this is, has the potential to be part of the future of finance, which I think many institutions do. They don't know exactly how it will play. And you were fortunate enough to miss, which most of the big allocators did, by the way. Most, you know, hedge funds were involved. Most of the allocators were not, certainly not heavily invested. And you missed that huge decline. And then you don't do anything. There's, there's career risk there too, by the way, because your job is to, you know, identify interesting opportunities, identify value, not do stupid things. But if you've, if you've bought after one of the greatest frauds in, you know, the last 10, 20 years, it's probably not, you know, and there's, there's some basis for the investment that you've done a lot of work on, which a lot of them have, then they're going to, they're going to come. So we're seeing, we're seeing institutions who will be making allocations in this space, um, to us this, this year. And I'm really excited about it. And they're, they're, you know, 
they're doing all sorts, they're looking at all sorts of things, um, by the way. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's been a wild cycle to participate in and be in, you know, in, in a sense in the center of, but um, we're coming, you know, we're going to come out the other side. It's interesting to hear this perspective because it really illustrates, uh, you used the word cadence earlier, a different cadence mm -hmm. in the way that institutions make their decisions, do their research, and then make allocations. Uh, and I, I want to go back and, and ask you about, you, you said FTT, FTX, and, and Luna as well. Uh, was evaluated and just did not pass the bar, so there was no allocation to it. Uh, one of the big stories of FTX was that it was the hot investment for so many VCs. Uh, like I, I remember, I've seen a few a few VC decks, uh, all of them trying to like you know boast their returns because that's what they do, that's the game. And so many of them had FTX prior to the blow up, had FTX as like look at this amazing uh, investment we made, and they're turned into this like mimetic intoxication about Luna too, Terra Luna too, as well as FTX. It was the thing. It had this like gravitational pull to so many in the crypto industry uh, and both turned out to be just uh, terrible mistakes in hindsight. Uh, but something about um, your vetting process at, at One River uh, looked at Luna, looked at FTX, looked at FTT and said, there's too many unknowns here. There's too many red flags. Okay, wh what's different about your vetting process and the cadence set to which an institution allocates a crypto? Well, why did that show up on your guys' radar as red flags when so many uh, in the crypto industry fell for it? Um, I, I really don't want to characterize this as like as we're really smart and everyone else, um, you sure. know, fell for uh, you know, something that was fraudulent or because that's that's not the case. I think. I think we're we're just very conservative in how we approach these things. There's certain general principles that um, that I think apply over time. the The problem is they're they're hard to implement because at a certain part of that market cadence, um, there are behaviors and investments that are kind of difficult to resist. So I'll give you an example of that in a minute. But um, specifically in the case of Luna and FTT. Um, there are a number of, of quantitative screens that we run on all the assets that we put into our, our index. And um, for instance, something that, that I don't, it's not that it's a flag, because it's, it wasn't flagging um, bad actor activity or anything. It just was the, the free float was, was such that um, we weren't comfortable with it. You know, it's like if, if um, you know, over time, if I invest in something, if, if, if over time, you know, and I try, I try to think about things, if I repeated this behavior 10 times or 100 times, would I make money? Would I not make money? The, the reality is, even the worst, like literally the worst investment, if you, if, you, if, you do it, if you did that 100 times, there probably would be times that you might make some money for a period of time. And maybe you make a lot of money. But, I, you know, try to think about sample sets. So if you're going to be buying assets where someone owns a ton of them, and they're not, you know, freely traded and they can make the decision f because they had too much leverage in their business or they just wanted to cash out or there was some type of regulatory shift that took place or some like or there was a bad actor, like which is what we what we saw you when there's, you know, when there's highly, highly concentrated ownership. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are going to be a lot of times where, you, where you're going to lose a lot of money, not a little bit of money, you're going to lose a lot of money. So that, you know, from a quantitative screen standpoint, there was that. I think with Luna, you know, Marcel Kazumovich, who's our uh, head of research and deputy CIO for our digital business is, um, you know, uh, certainly one of the top few minds in, in crypto. Um, and, uh, uh, he, you know, he had done a lot of work on Luna and had, you know, we didn't want to come out and, and aggressively say this thing could unwind, uh, but we did. You know, we did publish and something that you know Im implied that there are scenarios where it, the structurally it was you know it hadn't passed some magical point where it had no downside. You know, there there was a reflexive downside risk in the construction of you know, of that. And, um, you know, obviously that's what ended up happening. Didn't mean that it had to happen, by the way. It just meant that it was vulnerable to that happening. And, and if you think in probabilities and you just, you know, we mm -hmm. were, um, if it had screened, by the way, 
into our index, I think we would have had to take a serious look at that because I, um, I like to be on the right side of potential um, convexity and reflexivity in markets. And, and I definitely don't want to be the wrong way around in, in that. Um, so anyway, that was that. But when you, you were talking about the cadence of behaviors in these markets, and I think this was, this was a, it was a difficult thing for us. Um, I am, I'm, I'm proud that we resisted the temptation, but the, the DeFi yields that were available. So one of, one of our products is, is a fund called digital income. And, um, when we were all last speaking, um, I think that the yields available for over collateralized lending in this space, meaning, you know, you give me $200 million of Bitcoin, I give you, I lend you a hundred million dollars. You park that in a third party custodian. And if the value of that collateral drops from 200 to, um, 150, you either have to top it up or I have the right to start liquidating that in old school parlance, uh, you know, traditional finance, that would just be a really boring tri-party repo, uh, arrangement. And for that, we were paid roughly a yield of five to 8%. Okay. Boring, but good entry point for investors who want to understand this space, you know, it, by the way, when interest rates are zero, five to eight percent is great. The the issue was, you know, you go to Celsius or wherever, and it's twenty percent. And we looked at that, and we just said, look, it sounds optic. Well, optically, that's a really high interest rate in a zero rate world. Kind of like my comments about be skeptical of of you know people who make money too quickly or things that te- that appear to be too good to be true. Um, we looked at that and and concluded that. While those rates optically were high, they in no way compensated for the potential risk of investors in, you know, in DeFi in in it you know, as it was constructed, and so we just didn't do it. But you know, when you're going and sitting in front of um, large institutional allocators, and they go, "So what? You know, what what do you think is interesting for me to do to kind of get started?" And we're like, "Well, we think digital income is pretty interesting. Like the guys who just came in here are offering twenty percent yields, and you're five to eight percent, and you just." You know, naturally, you it's a lot easier to sound smart now than it was then. <laughs> right? and you, like you want to sound smart and you and, you know, there are business pressures on, on you. Um, but we, we you know, we did resist that temptation. But I think those are, you know, it, it, that that is how you build institutional credibility over a long period of time. That is how you build a track record. And sometimes you just have to walk away and say no and recognizing that you have to take risks to make money. Um, but anyway, that's. um uh, there were other examples in crypto that were like that, where it was just like, you, ha- you got sucked in, um, or, or many people got sucked in who otherwise would have been more sober had it not been this kind of new technology. Sometimes you just have to walk away. Sometimes you just have to not get greedy about this. I want to ask you about another, uh, group from, you know, our cast of characters in 2022 and get just your, your opinion on this, uh, three arrows capital hedge fund. You guys are a hedge fund. You've been around mm-hmm. hedge funds for a very long time. What happened there? What's your analysis of what went wrong at Three Arrows Capital? When you look at that, do you see just a uh, bunch of kids running money when you know they shouldn't have, taking unnecessary risks? Was there something else at play here? Um, all right. Guys, I'm not ageist, okay? So I'm not going to say it's a bunch of kids. And hopefully you're not going to say, <laughs> you know, you call me an old man or something. Um, we so. honestly, so here's <laughs> one impression I have coming out of this. Speaking of the kind of, it's not an ageist thing. It's just like, I sometimes I feel like um, crypto people are too naive and we benefit from wisdom that can be offered by those with more experience. But sometimes people in crypto are very quick to say, no, this time it's different. Your rules don't apply. And sometimes they're right. And sometimes they're very, very wrong. So I, please uh, bestow your wisdom on us. Mm. I mean, have you ever seen this before? What do you think went wrong with 3 Hours Capital? Okay, so I'll share with you my framework for how, how I think about at the meta level most of these, uh, most of these issues. And uh, by the way, probably applies to FTX as well. Um, uh, you know, like certain, certain over leveraged loss making enterprises or trades, if you have the wrong leadership that doesn't own up to their mistakes, 
um, it can lead to a fraud. It didn't necessarily have to start at a fraud. It could lead to a fraud um, because, you know, humans have big egos and we're frail and we're, you know, we're all, all these, we have so many weaknesses that don't blend well with leverage and losses and, you know, and, and real in public humiliation. So, um, but I think the, the, the framework to think about this um, actually comes through uh, or from uh, Jay Clayton, who's our, uh, you know, leads our advisory council. And, and he's written about this. Jay Clayton, uh, former uh, uh, chair of the SEC. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Jay, Jay's fantastic. And so one of the things that, uh, and he's written about this numerous times in his opinion pieces in the wall street journal and has spoken about it, um, is that, th is that crypto is a very, very unique financial innovation in that it was a retail first financial innovation that has reluctantly been accepted maybe not embraced, but just kind of acknowledged or accepted by institutions. Reluctantly. And, yeah, right. So, but that's, that, that's like a simple statement, but the consequences are profound. And I'll, I'll, I'll kind of circle back to how it affects three arrows or something. So um, I think what happened with crypto is that, you know, Bitcoin appeared, however you want to characterize it, it, it appeared, it was retail only, it kind of grew and grew. There are plenty of Good actors and some bad actors uh, early on. That ratio has obviously changed dramatically, so that they're you know very small tail of bad. There are more bad actors in in, ca in cash globally than there are in, in crypto. I'd say, um, albeit crypto gets you know a bad bad name for this. But at any rate, so that was kind of the the progression. Um, and what happened was, um, I think the institutions they looked at the bad actors and something that objectively speaking, was intended to kind of disrupt their business. And they just said, stay away, stay away, stay away. We're not going to focus on it. And, the, and that allowed the regulators to not have to focus on it because they didn't even really know who to focus on to regulate. And it was sufficiently small that that crypto was just able to go through a variety of different cycles without a really strong regulatory focus and certainly without a regulatory foundation, right? And so... When we got into this last cycle, just on a total, you know, assets, the market cap of crypto got very, very big, right? And so um, it dwarfed anything previously. And now it, 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 it forced um, institutions to have to take it seriously. They had spent enough time. There were enough people within their organizations that they started doing the work to understand how could this really affect our business? Should we be investing in it? not just the coins, but the technologies, like all of this stuff happened. But what, what was lacking was any kind of real regulatory foundation that would have happened if, for instance, in uh, uh, financial innovation like CDOs, you know, the, the kind of the, um, all these, these, uh, these bonds that have been packaged, these mortgages that have been packaged in, o in 05, 06, 07, 08, and then kind of blew up the financial world. They, as bad as those were in the financial industry, they still had to be traded in regulatory in regulated entities. There were there still were some sane people who had been around the block a number of times, and it still blew up, right? But now, if you think about if you think about what happened in crypto with say three arrows or any of these other blowups, you you had there were no regulators. Most of the people who were prominent did not have a lot of experience at that level of market cap with that kind of leverage. And there always are going to be some people who just absolutely swing for the fences. So I don't know the three arrows guys well enough to, to have an opinion about what why they made decisions they did. But I think it's you would expect in a in a essentially a non-regulated market with people who who didn't have decades of financial experience without the the kind of the checks and balances that happen in a lot of these large banks, organizations, hedge funds, et cetera, you, you would expect that there are going to be some really big blow ups. And it's just the market cap got so big that when they, when they happened, they they appeared catastrophic. Um, I think if if you had taken those CDOs, right, um, if you had taken the, the, those kind of packaged mortgage bonds and all that stuff, if if that had started in the um, retail market in 05, 06, 07 hadn't been regulated, there would have been catastrophic. I mean, 
I don't, maybe, maybe the blowups wouldn't have been as big as it had, you know, um, had it been in retail relative to Wall Street, but I think that they would have. I mean, that just because there's just no, there's no infrastructure for checks and balances. So I don't, again, I like, who am I to say someone's made poor decisions? I mean, cl- clearly Three Arrows di- did. I, I just don't know what the motivation was, but it doesn't surprise me that you had these outcomes at all. Right. And we, we often say in the crypto world, we're speed running the history of money and finance. And one of the things that we are learning here is that human psyche is hard to control, especially as it relates to uh, markets that move very fast. Like one of the crazy things about crypto is that we go through an entire business cycle inside of four years. We see the highest highs and the lowest lows inside of four years. And human emotions just can't really deal with that at, at that kind of speeds. And since crypto is so young, we don't really have the guardrails up that are in the traditional finance world that came from raw experience, that when you don't have these guardrails up, uh, you let emotions take control. So I do definitely take the point that like Three Arrows Capital started off as a totally legitimate prop trading desk, like work in the GBTC trade, very legitimate. And over time, uh, like, like risk off trade and same thing with Alameda research actually started off with these very reasonable trades that took on more and more and more risk because things always would go up in, in the first half of the bull market and there were no guardrails to, to manage human expectations. Um, I think that's a pretty, pretty safe claim to make is that like, well, we just haven't learned how to self-manage ourselves because so we, we don't. And that's why our institutions aren't that big, because they keep on blowing up because they don't have guardrails yet. And, and Eric, there's a there's a, a philosophical, maybe maybe philosophical is not the right word, but just like when you when I was asking you about FTT and Luna and FTX, uh, you gave your thought process and it was very much an attitude of this doesn't pass the bar. This doesn't pass. And it's, it's more of a conservative approach. And it's, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like, you really don't want to be wrong as an institutional money manager. Whereas like, perhaps if I'm trying to put myself into the three O's capital shoes, they were really trying to be right. They made very specific targeted investments and really wanted to be right. They seem to not want to miss anything. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And they, and so I think perhaps what it means to be an institution with guardrails up and processes and rules. It's more of an aversion to unknowns and really not wanting to be wrong. Whereas perhaps the more uh, immature industry, the more Im- immature investors like, oh, I have to be right. I have to find the next alpha. Can, can you just um, see if I'm tapping into anything here? Like, what, can you elaborate on, on this kind of philosophy of how you make investment decisions? Yeah. Um, some of it has to do with time horizon. So, Mm -hmm. you know, if you're, um, if you have a short enough time horizon, you can convince yourself that even the most speculative investment or even a fraud, if you, it, it could still be something where you could make money if you've, if you've identified the market setup, the right momentum, the, this, the, that, you know, whatever. Um, if you have a, if you have a, a longer term time horizon, which we which we tend to do, just not to say that we can't get into a trade and then and then reassess it because you know Powell makes a speech and you go, well, I think our, our premise was wrong, and and then we get out of it. But our, our time horizon tends to be longer term, and when we are doing something like constructing an index, our approach is we want to construct an institutional index which will serve as a benchmark for the institutions that we think are going to come into this industry. And it's important that, you know, in many respects, we kind of honor the way that they would think about it, which is the way we think about it, which is to do things like avoid, you know, avoid assets where there's incredibly concentrated ownership. So it's not that we're, we're trying to avoid being wrong per se. It's, I think that we're trying, um, it's a good question. It's a difficult one to answer, but I think it's, if I, if I, to answer it, I would say that when you when when you invest and trade for I don't know what am I I'm thirty four years at this stage, you see so many things that are good and you feel that euphoria. Like I I described that Italian lira trade that I had. I remember what it was like for my boss to pull me in the office and say, "We have our largest client who wants to sell the literally." 
almost to the, you know, the million lira or, or whatever that you have and you can, you can get out. And I was like, if they want to sell, I want to sell more because <laughs> it's like, if, the, if like, if that's what's happening, it's going down. Like I, I am self-aware enough to remember that I was, it, it was euphoric to make that much money at such a young age. You know, I was in my twenties, um, at, at the time. And I, I, I wasn't making, I wasn't making Sam Bankman free money, but like, you know, for me, that was a really euphoric period. And I remember how wrong I was and how those instincts were, you know, were wrong, but you have, you can't, you can't read that in a book. You, if you, if you experience those things and those emotions and temptations in yourself, and you can check yourself on that and you can somehow kind of navigate this very difficult pursuit for a lot of years, there are certain principles that, that kind of, that bubble up. And, you know, and I've mentioned some of them today. Like if you see people who make way too much money at a really young age, you probably don't need, you know, to be doing a lot of business with them. Um, you know, it's, it, they're, they're, it's a flag. It's, it doesn't mean that they're a bad person. It's just, there are a lot of things to do in the world. You don't have to do everything in the world. You just have to try to do the things that where you see the setup in such a way that it's really smart. There are a lot of crypto assets that you can buy. You don't need to buy the ones where there's incredibly tight, concentrated ownership, which could be liquidated due to over leverage or liquidated due to bad activity or just because they want to. You don't have to. And so if you kind of line all those up and you, and, and those are just like the filters that become I don't want to say second nature, but you just know you're always going to, you're always going to run that through that filter. It's going to help you. And so, you know, I don't know that that's wisdom. It's just, it's experience. By the way, it's experience for people who, who have really been beaten up too. Like you don't, you don't get to, you don't get to go through decades of this without having really bad experiences yourself and, um, you know, and, and a lot of soul searching. Um, but, you know, you're rewarded in the sense that if it, it improves your judgment, if you're introspective and you're honest with yourself. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It's it's almost um, a privilege that crypto runs on these such uh, short boom bust cycles because mm. those that stay in crypto get taught so many lessons, lessons that sometimes I think in traditional finance really take decades uh, to prove out. Like we we get hit with it, and sometimes we get hit with it young, and that is a uh, an advantage in our investment uh, career. This is what, this is how we level up through this kind of hard fought um, knowledge and, and experience in the trenches. Um, Eric, I wanna go back to something you were saying earlier about uh, part of the nature of this crypto thing is that it's a retail phenomenon. And so regulators have been slow on the scene. One observation that I have, and I don't know if you agree with this or not, is uh, one of the things that held up pretty strong in crypto last year was actually DeFi. And I would say the reason DeFi held up strong is because it is regulated. And uh, that might be counterintuitive to people. What I mean by that is DeFi is very much transparent and regulated in code. Uh, a cool thing about Aave and Compound is you can right click and see all of the assets that back those po particular positions. You couldn't do that in a Celsius. You couldn't do that in a BlockFi. It was a complete black box. Um, one of the approaches I wish regulators would take in this space is to recognize that regulation can mean different things in this crypto space than it means in traditional markets. Regulation can mean regulation by transparent, auditable code that is publicly available. And so when regulators touch these markets, they need to take that into account. And uh, they need to touch things in DeFi a little bit differently than uh, in centralized finance. One of the takes bankless uh, David and I often repeat is, um, if it is centralized, then it should be regulated by regulators, right? Uh, and I do think that is something that we uh, we missed, of course, on the, the CFI side of things, particularly with these CFI lending blowups. But let me ask you this: um, I know you're also plugged into this world. Uh, Jay Clayton is is you know part of uh, one of your advisors um, on mm -hmm. the team, I believe. Um, yep. What are regulators doing about this? And I guess, what's your take on this? What should regulators be doing? Uh, how should they address um, crypto markets? What would you like to see in the US? So um, I'll, I'll borrow, from, uh, I'll borrow from, from Jay here in terms of um, a piece that he penned with the former chairman of the CFTC as well. So you, know, you know, kind of have former SEC and CFTC chairman 
jointly published something. I is can this, send you guys uh, a link to this. Chris the Giancarlo, the former CTC? No, um, uh, Tim Massad. Got it. Um, and their, their prescription for what should be done right now is to, number one, just introduce sensible, uh, set standards. Um, so provide guidance to centralized exchanges at a minimum for um, sensible uh, customer protections. So, you know, like not commingling assets, not, like all the, all the things that are just, you know, not too much leverage. Um, like don't run a fund aside your, uh, no fraud, your right? Don't, don't have, don't have um, inherent conflicts of interest, you know, set right next to one another. So those are all things that I think everyone could agree on. And I think everyone on certainly the three of us could agree I think on all those things, because they're just like, obviously that's, that should be the case. The issue I think is that, um, that because that guidance hasn't been provided, there are plenty of actors, which include some bad actors or certainly have now a lot of them are gone who just took the view that it's like, well, there's no guidance. So I'm just not going to do anything. And, and I think the advantage of providing some guidance around saying like, look, we're not sure how we're going to regulate everyone right now, but there's certain things that you should really, that are sensible for your business, you should think about. So one of them is, is articulating kind of sensible customer protections, um, for retail, um, that would apply to institutions as well, by the way. The other thing is, is really provide guidance around stable coin. Stable coin is, is kind of the, you know, killer app in terms of this whole, whole space. And I think that, um, it's likely that private sector dollar stablecoin becomes one of the most important innovations in f- global finance over the next 20, 30 years. But, in, by the way, in, are you surprised in, people in, in government don't actually see this? That this is actually the, uh, the way to export the U.S. dollar, right? Like, uh, what do you, what's, what's the U.S.'s plan, uh, you know, to combat and to space race um, China's central bank digital currency? It's much more tightly controlled. Yeah, I think that I think that a lo- plenty of politicians do, and I think this FTX debacle it, it was a setback in terms of timing. But I think we're going to get there. I think that there are um, plenty of politicians and regulators um, uh, who we speak with who they they understand, and so I think if you do those two things, if you if you provide guidance around uh, stablecoin. You introduce, you know, standards for protection of consumers, and then you try to. Uh, this is what Jay advocates. You, you try to um, creatively think about how to apply that to DeFi because it's not it's not necessarily obvious from a regulator's perspective. Then you've gone a long way in terms of providing a, enough clarity to the good entrepreneurs and the good actors who say, "Okay, well, listen, I get it." So I'm not I'm not just going to get a random enforcement action. I'm not suggesting that all that. I think a lot of their enforcement actions are not random, um, but you but you can say if the SEC shows up, if the CFTC shows up, and I've done all of these things that they provided guidance on well, I'm sure it's going to be a pretty good conversation to, to the point where it won't be a very long conversation, right? And the, the issue is there's cost to compliance there, which just means what, if you're going to weed out the dodgy bad actors that never intended to to comply and never intended to kind of really do the right thing or wanted to cut corners. So, I think that that's uh, that that's Jay's what he's advocating, um, and, and that over time will will you know as these assets mature uh, and banks begin to embed them into their you know their trading and settlement processes and all of this stuff, like we'll get to a place where um, we'll buy time for for. Uh, healthy regulation and clarity. Is, so I think that I think that that's I think that that's probably where where we go. Unfortunately, we got set you know set back a little bit. Is that the is that the thing that's holding institutional adoption back still? Lack of regulatory clarity. So if we had this regulatory clarity, would you expect kind of a, a flood of institutional interest into this asset class? I th- I think it would accelerate, but I don't think it would I don't think it would be a flood. I mean the one the institutions that we're talking to. Um, the institutions that we're talking to are kind of not U.S. taxpayers. They're, you know, they're pensions, endowments. So, you know, they're investing offshore. They, you know, they're, they're like, they're very sophisticated investors. And um, their view is that 
we don't know where this is all going. It's clearly not going away entirely. And that could mean a whole range of different financial outcomes in terms of what these assets are worth. And they're even open to maybe the assets aren't actually worth that much money, but the technologies will be. And so we need to kind of make sure that we understand um, these technologies. We have some position in these assets. We may have some position in trading strategies, some position in venture capital in this space. And if we do that, we're going to learn a, a you know heck of a lot. And um, and we're we're not going to just be on the sidelines if if this becomes what it could become, right? So like if you um, if you look at uh, Kathy Wood, right? She, you know, if you look at at her work, I mean, she has projections for massive levels of adoption for huge market cap for um, smart contract, smart contracts annually producing, you know, God only knows how many billions of dollars in revenue, et cetera. And by the way, not far off, like 2030. Now she's right or she's wrong. But if you're, if you, you're sitting on a huge endowment, are you really going to have literally no exposure to that space? That's, that's not it. So I think if, I think that that investors believe here's here's what I is a kind of safe thing to say. Investors believe, large institutional investors believe, at a, as a whole, that if these assets become adopted by the large financial players in the U.S. and internationally, then what will naturally follow is some type of uh, clear regulatory um, framework for them. That will happen because the pressure will be coming from incumbents who just say, look, we need guidance around here. Otherwise, Coinbase is going to completely destroy our business. You know, if you're one of these custodians and like think about think about this world, which I think about a lot, by the way, think about a world where, you know, Bank of New York and State Street and all these custodians, they're great counterparties. We work with them in our business. They're wonderful people. They're huge legacy players. And imagine that Larry Fink and his his call for every bond and every equity to ultimately get tokenized. Okay, so you got the guy who's running BlackRock, the largest asset manager in the world, saying that's that's what's going to happen. And you have and you're one of these custodians. Are you really going to just let Coinbase absolutely completely dominate your world? I, I, by the way, Coinbase might dominate the world anyway because they're so far behind. But you you literally your your choice is I'm going to just sit here and try to work with the regulators to obstruct any innovation in the US, and in, in which case, by the way, it gets pushed abroad and then the UK will do stuff and Canada and Switzerland and Dubai and everything. Or are you going to say, I got to start investing in this? And if you do invest in it, then you go to the regulators and you go, we need some clarity because we're making big capital investments and we need to understand where you come out on this stuff. So I think that's that'll be, the, that'll be that mechanism. Well, that is the game theory of it, right? And I think you'll have some mm -hmm. banks that try to stop it. But then other banks that that break rank. I mean, Fidelity is doing uh, incredible things in mm -hmm. crypto, and they have for a very long time. If they break rank, then uh, they they certainly are are whispering in the regulators' ears to push this forward. And so it becomes game theoretically an unsustainable position to be anti crypto and trying to block it. That might work for a period of time, but but not forever. I I want to ask you kind of an, another comment because we've been uh, talking about uh, 2022 as a setback, right? But you've been in a lot of markets. Um, this may seem glib to say, but I feel like 2022 was good for crypto. It was actually healthy for crypto. And I just, the, the way I justify saying something like that, Eric, is the counterfactual of like, what would have happened if crypto got to $10 trillion asset class last cycle? Which look, it got to three. I mean, could have happened. What would have happened if um, FTX had grown, you know, 5X, 10X larger? SBF had grown 5x more influential in Congress. Look, he was passing, working on crypto legislation. We already know there were tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in donations going to our, our, our Congress. What would have happened if, if Luna got that much bigger and then blew up? The counterfactual is actually scarier to me than uh, what happened in 2022. And I, I wonder if that instinct is, is correct, given what you've seen in markets, like, is it a good thing that we went through this? Um, I guess a great question to to ask, and uh, uh, I, I think yeah, I think your counterfactual would have been very scary um, to have had to have had crypto create real 
financial stability issues for the global economy would have been devastating, I think, for crypto. Um, and I think as it stands, there were some deep embarrassments and humiliations and everything else, but it didn't, it didn't infect the, the broader economy and it didn't affect, didn't infect the financial system. And that's really important. And I think what it, what it leads to is the regulators who have been kind of slow peddling this, they go, okay, this will be important to kind of continue to keep crypto um, separated from, from the, the main financial system. Um, and I think that, that actually ironically is a good thing for crypto because it's going to keep the traditional financial players for the next couple, few years at arm's length, more or less. And it allow the younger, more, um, I think, uh, I don't mean, I, I hate knocking anyone, like the more, more younger, more creative. Now I'm being ageist, um, the younger, more creative, <laughs> you know, entrepreneurially minded people too. I mean, these technologies are so exciting. So I think a lot of good things will happen with that separation. That separation will, will make certain things more difficult, but I think it's, it's better for the overall industry. And I, I'd actually like to circle back just really quickly to something you said earlier, which is that, you know, maybe um, it's good that these cycles happen so fast because, you know, younger people or just people involved in these can really experience some of those trading lessons. And, you know, I obviously am biased because I've chosen this path in my career and, you know, I, I, I often try to dissuade people from doing it just because I know how hard it is. And the only people who really should do it are, are the people who I just have this dying desire to put themselves at risk, try to make reasoned judgments, et cetera, et cetera. And the, you know, many, if not most of, of, the most introspective people who who over time do not become egomaniacs but are you know um get to know themselves well have done it because they've chosen a pursuit that really challenges them and it forces them to have to admit error it forces them to have to confront you know mistakes of greed or fear or anything like that and trading Trading is an incredible venue for that. And so if someone really wants to do it, then they should. And, and I think even of those people, not that many will be really successful over their, their careers. But even if they don't, I think they'll, you learn a lot more about yourself and certain life lessons that apply in all areas of your life through that pursuit than say, not to pick on being a lawyer, but like being a lawyer or, or, you know, being, being someone in a job where you're, where it's rare that you have to confront the fact that you really got something wrong and you have to, you know, like cut your losses, deal with that, deal with humiliation, turn to your spouse or your, you know, significant other. And just like, I really, you know, I, I, I screwed up. And, and I think those are, um, as someone who thinks life is a, about learning a lot of these lessons, I think this is th this is a, a great area to do that. And so I was happy that you that you said that. Oh, I wanted to, to look, kind of Eric, swing that. This is what I love most about kind of investing. You just made the case for being an investor, right? Which is like, mm -hmm. um, it is one of the only fields, maybe besides science. I don't want to you know, put investing in kind of the, the level of science. Science is better than investing. Let me just say that. But it's <laughs> there's an objective truth about it. Like mm -hmm. uh, not many other fields do you get to find out whether you're right or wrong, like numerically. And the stakes are very, very high, aren't they? Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, your story earlier about you being in kind of your 20s and the, the headiness of, of some of these trades and, you know, making a lot of money uh, for yourself at that age and how, how crazy that is. Now imagine too what we see so often in, in, um, in crypto is you've got that. And you've got kind of the money aspect and it's maybe even amplified to how much you can make in a very short period of time. And then you also have this like social media effect where mm -hmm. you can actually be like a trader God influencer. And this is what we saw. It's like you know, fund managers, like the, 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 uh, our friends with the Arrows capital being put on this pedestal. And like, I know just from being on Twitter, the, the way it can kind of warp your ego, right? And make you think things about yourself, either in the positive or negative, that aren't objective reality. Like that's a double trip. Not only do you have the money, you got this whole like fame, ego, warp, reality distortion field that's going on in social media. And I'm like, wow, that is a, 
you know, no wonder we have kind of the SBFs of the world. And what's so interesting to me is Eric is he got off on uh, a bond. And what's the first thing he does? He starts tweeting again. He opens up a sub stack, right? It's just mm -hmm. like, there's something, I'm not a psychologist, but there's something in this uh, that is, uh, is also kind of amplifying um, the effects of some of these things. I think it's all tied up with, with ego. Yeah. One of our, um, one of our investors and, uh, actually an uh, investor with whom we, uh, we, we made our first investments in crypto, his theme for last year was, uh, which is just, he's, he's a real iconoclast, one of the greatest investors, um, who, uh, you know, who I've had the pleasure to, to get really close with and, uh, an awesome human being as well. But his theme for last year was, um, um, was, um, uh, basically sh kind of short, a short ego, you know, <laughs> like be, I think it was, I think the, I think in his investor letter, it was, um, be short narcissism was, you know, is what it was. And so I um, would have made a lot of money in 2022. Yeah. Yeah. And they, you know, I mean, they're a real money firm and they, you know, they produced positive returns last year when, um, everyone else was down a lot of money. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, very impressive performance, but, but yeah, you know, that's, it, it, you're exactly right. You know, it's, it's, uh, that's th going back to that thing we talked about earlier where it started in, in retail and then you just, you know, you don't have guardrails. You got a lot of young people, you got a lot of narcissism. Um, and, uh, it, it's almost like unfair. Like how can someone who's, um, you know, how, how would I've handled myself in my twenties <laughs> with that, that Italy thing? If, if I hadn't, you know, had someone who was a lot wiser, um, who, who just is like, hey, by the way, he was probably, bearish on Italy too, but he could feel it himself. He's like, when I get this bearish, I got to, I just got to cover, <laughs> I, you know, I, I can come up with 20 reasons. And by the way, my boss, just as an aside, he was, he was awesome. He was notorious for, you know, he'd come to the desk and, and he'd say, you know, I'm, I'm going to go buy a um, ton of uh, dollar versus the yen and, uh, or sell it or whatever. And, and I'm like, why are you doing that? And he's like, look at this, you know, look at this report. And he'd set, you know, he'd put it on my desk and it was two years old. <laughs> but yeah, really good instincts, you know? So um, anyway. Learning about crypto is hard. Until now. Introducing MetaMask Learn, an open educational platform about crypto, Web3, self-custody, wallet management, and all the other topics needed to onboard people into this crazy world of crypto. MetaMask Learn is an interactive platform with each lesson offering a simulation for the task at hand, giving you actual practical experience for navigating Web3. The purpose of MetaMask Learn is to teach people the basics of self-custody and wallet security in a safe environment. And while MetaMask Learn always takes the time to define Web3 specific vocabulary, vocabulary, it is still a jargon-free experience for the crypto curious user. Friendly, not scary. MetaMask Learn is available in 10 languages with more to be added soon, and it's meant to cater to a global Web3 audience. So are you tired of having to explain crypto concepts to your friends? Go to learn.metamask.io and add MetaMask Learn to your guides to get onboarded into the world of Web3. How many total airdrops have you gotten? This last bull market had a ton of them. Did you get them all? Maybe you missed one. So here's what you should do. Go to Earnify and plug in your Ethereum wallet and Earnify will tell you if you have any unclaimed airdrops that you can get. And it also does PO apps and mintable NFTs. Any kind of money that your wallet can claim, Earnify will tell you about it. And you should probably do it now because some airdrops expire. And if you sign up for Earnify, they'll email you anytime one of your wallets has a new airdrop for it to make sure that you never lose an airdrop ever again. You can also upgrade to Earnify Premium to unlock access to airdrops that are beyond the basics and are able to set reminders for more wallets. And for just under $21 a month, it probably pays for itself with just one airdrop. So plug in your wallets at Earnify and see what you get. That's E-A-R-N-I dot F-I. And make sure you never lose another airdrop. The Phantom Wallet is coming to Ethereum. The number one wallet on Solana is bringing its millions of users and beloved UX to Ethereum and Polygon. If you haven't used Phantom before, you've been missing out. Phantom was one of the first wallets to pioneer Solana staking inside the wallet and will be offering similar staking features for Ethereum and Polygon. But that's just staking. Phantom is also the best home for your NFTs. Phantom has a complete set of features to optimize your NFT experience. Pin your favorites, hide your uglies, burn the spam, and also manage your NFT 
guarantee sale listings from inside the wallet. Phantom is of course a multi-chain wallet, but it makes chain management easy, displaying your transactions in a human readable format with automatic warnings for malicious transactions or phishing websites. Phantom has already saved over 20,000 users from getting scammed or hacked. So get on the Phantom waitlist and be one of the first to access the multi-chain beta. There's a link in the show notes, or you can go to phantom.app slash waitlist to get access in late February. Eric, I want to pivot the conversation a little bit to um, back to uh, a perspective that I think only you or a few people like you could have, which is um, institutional allocation, institutional exposure to, to the crypto world. Um, there's what I'll call blunt exposure, which is just perhaps buying Ether, Bitcoin, just the most obvious things that are smart, not to say not smart, like smart, smart things to do. At least mm -hmm. that's what I think, Bitcoin and Ether, but bl uh, albeit blunt. Um, and I'll think perhaps that's where uh, institutions start. They, they'll dip their toe in the waters. Maybe there's even uh, easier ways to get started with that. But that's kind of how we talked about uh, when we interviewed you last uh, last October 2021. So that was one of the first moves, uh, you know, buying the blue chips. And I'm interested to hear how this perhaps has developed, uh, perhaps for One River, but also what you hear with other institutional strategies to get exposure to crypto. How has that developed over the last year? Or has it gotten more precise? Have strategies gotten more uh, more specific? Anything? What's the progression of institutional exposure to the crypto world? Yeah, so because far? one thing um, Dave and I noticed when we were um, thinking about talking to you today, Eric, is we went over to the One River website under mm -hmm. a section you have research called Research. Looked at the digital asset section and a few of kind of the the articles that you've published here, and you're talking about some pretty detailed stuff here, right? You're talking about when you, uh, when you cite Dank Rad Feist as a source. Yeah. I know you're down in the basement <laughs> yeah. level of research. There's, yeah. You don't go any deeper than there, that. There's, here, here's one line. Um, <laughs> Ethereum is preparing to store a new form of data. The change will carve out a special location for unstructured blobs, allowing layer two's cheaply readily available space. This is exactly right. But this is like down into the firmware level um, of what's happening. I mean, this is tuning into kind of like Ethereum research calls. Uh, I didn't know that like funds were at this level of analysis. And uh, I don't know, it just maybe you were doing this before and we just didn't see it, but it really feels like One River has kind of leveled up its game and we're curious about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe I look dumb, but I'm, I'm not that dumb. You know, like if, we're, if, we're, if, if we're if we're going to get into if we're if we're going to aspire to be the leading institutional asset manager in digital assets, um, it's not because we're just you're not you know, playing around here. Like it's like, hey, you know, the Fed's hiking rates, so we should be short Bitcoin. Um, I think, uh, uh, or vice versa. You know, so. Um, but yeah, so I mean, we've built out an amazing team um, under uh, you know under Marcel. Um, uh, Kazumovich is deputy CIO and head of, head of research. And, um, you know, he was, um, I've known him, I knew him for 10 years. I, I, I've always wanted to work with Marcel. He was the chief strategist for George Soros, by the way, through the 08 crisis and helped, helped Soros. Um, I mean, he, he worked directly, he was George's chief strategist personally, and, you know, helped the, that organization navigate to a very positive, uh, outcome through that period. And, um, his, his first crypto, investment was 20, I think he bought Bitcoin in, you know, 2013, 20, you know, 2014, something like that when he was doing some work with the IMF, um, about the nature of money and no one wanted to talk about, no one wanted to look at crypto and Marcel is an incredibly curious human being. And he just raised his hand. He's like, I'll, I'll look at that. And, and he looked at it long enough to say, I should buy some. So, um, you know, he's, He's pretty. Uh, he's an incredible intellect, and he's built out, you know, a team that um, that that does deep work in, you know, in, in all these assets. Um, we're also building out, you know, we're we've taking we are taking. Um, so you talked about DeFi, and you talked a little about regulation through code, which I think is um, I think is a really nice way of looking at it, and an accurate way of looking at it, and a and a. You know, kind of something that's really unique in this time in history because that kind of wasn't that was never possible before. So, so stuff like that is is just fantastic from my perspective. Um, I think our our perspective on DeFi is that while that statement that you made is true, that the challenge for crypto for these markets will be that 
they still need to operate in a world where anti-money laundering and bad actors and fraudsters, you know, where their lives are made difficult. It's not that you can't stop all of that because you never can. Um, but but it, anyway, so I, I think that DeFi, while it is regulated by, you know, by code uh, right now, I think that it's going to have to figure out how how to be accepted by across the the real developed market. So all the developed jurisdictions. So I'm not talking about, you know, some African or um, South American country that just, you know, doesn't have great rule of law and or Iran or something. I'm talking about, you know, the real, the, the, the parts of the world that really the matter. Is. Yeah. I think that there, um, I think the combination of what you said together with some type of way of identifying the, the users of these protocols, um, is going to unlock the true um, promise of these technologies, and so our view, our strong view, is that that is going to happen. And so when we looked at DeFi early on, which we obviously did, um, and I told you that we avoided it, we avoided it for a couple of reasons. One, um, one one of them was the like the returns relative to the risk just were insufficient from our perspective, but also our view is that. Um, because there isn't good AML KYC, or there isn't AML KYC in a lot of these protocols, our investors may end up with some type of medium to long-term liability, probably wouldn't be high. And we as, as an asset manager might have some liability for having participated in activities where we knew that you know, North Korea could have been on the other side of a trade and, uh, or you know, whoever it might be. And so, but what we did do is, and what our team here does do, is really understand what is happening in this space, um, much more so than I do on a, on a, you know, I didn't write that report that you just described. I read it, but I didn't write it. Um, and, you know, our view is that if we can take these technologies and we can adapt them to traditional financial markets and, and assets, and we can do it in a way that's consistent with what we think the regulatory regime will require in the US and Europe and Canada and you know all these various places, then I think we will have participated in, in we will have done something I'd be very proud of, which is to kind of advance these technologies and integrate them with traditional finance in ways where they really get used at scale. And so where we don't end up with, you know, with a, a big Wall Street bank that that you know, creates its its own blockchain system that's this closed system. And, you know, I, I th- by the way, that might happen. And I, that's not what I would like to see happen. And I, and I think it would be, a, you know, it would be a real compromise on the promise of these technologies. So anyway, um, that's, you know, when it comes to, to, to DeFi, that's, that's what we're doing there. It's, it's pretty fun. I mean, it's, it's fun, but it, it requires us to really un- understand and know everything that's going on there. So we're not just doing that work to understand investing in the specific tokens, but we, we feel like there, there shouldn't be a firm out there that is more knowledgeable about this entire space than us. There just shouldn't be. Maybe there is. I don't know who it is, by the way, but there shouldn't be. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, but by, by the way, when we made our first, um, investments in November 2020, what I just said was unambiguously not true. You know, it's like we, we were not the most knowledgeable, but we're, you know, we're pretty darn knowledgeable now. I, I feel the level level up. There must be a lot of uh, listening to the Bankless podcast over at the One River offices. Uh, I, I hope so. Yeah, you should come. You should get, yeah, yeah. Sean Martinek <laughs> is, is uh, he's, He's uh, uh, amazing. Uh, if he hadn't written that piece, it was, you know, he and Marcel probably jointly authored it. But you, you should definitely speak with, uh, great with Sean as well. He's he's amazing. Well, Ryan was uh, going for the punchline that I was trying to get out of you. But the question <laughs> I was going to ask is, uh, like, it, when it gives me faith that some some big institution can hire a team and charge that team with, hey, go understand crypto. Go learn about it. And then... Fast forward after, you know, learning and writing reports, you get a report on blob space. But I could have totally expected a report on IBM Hyperledger or how Terra Luna is fundamentally sustainable yeah. or something like We've that. Like people that. get sidetracked <laughs> when they go down the crypto rabbit holes. Uh, and so to, to see a report coming out about blob space and how that means like data, Ethereum's got this new data structure 
is like it's encouraging. Me. And I'm, 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 how do you, how do you know? Because a lot of people get lost along the way of trying to write reports about crypto because that's their, it's their job to write a report. And so like their boss charges them with writing a report. And so they go find something interesting. And then they see that this Terra Luna ecosystem has a bunch of like energy around it. And so they write a report on that and they just want to make a report on what the boss wants to hear, which is that this thing is totally going to work. And so they write a report on that. Like, how do you not fall into that trap? And how do you actually come out with a very detailed report on polynomials and block blob space? <laughs> Um, uh, first of all, you, you bring people on a team that are a lot smarter than you. That's, that's rule number one. Um, and then hopefully you set the, the example of, um, of being, uh, just deeply curious, you know, that as a, and I think it's easier for an asset manager to do that by the way, rather than a research company, because, you know, re, to your point, it's like, go write a report on this. Um, there's no, um, there's just less skin in the game. Um, and for, you know, people who are charged, whether they're on the sell side in wall street or just in a research firm, and, and which is not to say that th those people don't do terrific research. It's just that I think as an asset manager, it's kind of in, in our blood that if we're going to write something ab ab about something, we kind of own it reputationally and, um, we might even invest in it, or we might think about how to adapt that technology to something we're working on. And so... Um, that's it. And, and, uh, you know, we, one of the things that we did that, that I am proud of is that when we, when we entered this space, we wanted to bring the, the best partners, uh, you know, equity partners into the firm. And we, so Coinbase led that investment round. They've been amazing partners. Goldman was invested, Liberty Mutual Insurance, you know, um, Wafra, which is some ultimately Kuwaiti money. Um, their, their pension system, like, and, and infinity, we brought some really wonderful investors on board. And I think, um, that, you know, they have been curious to see how, like, how we're going to look at this space as well. And, you know, kind of the approach that I took was, okay, we're, we're going to be in this for the long run. So, we're going to raise a lot of money. So we, we raised a you know very nice chunk of equity capital so that we would be fundamentally sound, even in a crypto winter, which is not to say I anticipated the depth of this decline. But I knew that we're, we're going to be, even if we don't, you know, ev even if institutions don't come as fast as we hope that they do, we're going to be fine. And then we're just going to get really, really smart at this and we're going to start developing. And, um, and that has been, you know, that has been, a really important thing. And when you can, when you have that longer term horizon, you can also just not rush into hiring people really fast. So there's this temptation. I, I was looking around, actually, when we, when we were speaking last, there were all these firms that were doing these huge raises at silly valuations. And I, I was looking at them going, what are you even using that money for? It just, just doesn't even make any sense to me whatsoever. And I think we discovered what a lot of them use that money for, which is in, you know, lending money to Bitcoin miners. And, you know, now they're all over leveraged and trouble and all the rest of it. And, and they, they hired way too many people and they've had to lay off staff. We haven't, you know, we haven't laid off a single person here. And, and I, I say that um, we would if they weren't terrific, but we hired slowly and we hired the right people. And I, and I, I've learned long enough that if you don't have really deeply curious people on your team who are introspective, you, why even why even bother? You're not going to, you know, maybe you succeed for a little while, but you're not going to really succeed. So we kind of lined all of those things up. And I think that, you know, the key thing is just getting ultimately, it's a very long answer to your question, but it's like you have to get the right people in the right culture. And and that was what was most important to me. And so I think I'm, I am really, we, we hear from a lot of um uh, a lot of people that that we put out the best research in uh, in this space now, and uh, and they're you know those are great investors that read a lot. So I'm I'm very proud of the team for that. Yeah, I'm not taking credit uh, for it, by the way, but I'm very proud. Yeah. Uh, you know, across the team. You can pass along our kudos as well. Okay. Like we read a lot of uh, a lot of stuff, and that we, when I was I was only skimming it. Now I, I want like, to go I would down read this. after I have uh, some I was time. Like, I would read this. I would, this I would, I would read this. Fair, <laughs> I would read this. Uh -huh. Good, that's a compliment. Um, Thank you. 
Thank yeah. you. I, I want to uh, circle back. I think we skipped over the this the answer to this question, so I want to go back there one more time. Just more more precise exposure to cri- the crypto asset world beyond just like buying the blue chips, Bitcoin and Ether. H- has anything developed in the last year that institutions really like as a strategy to gain exposure to crypto? So we're um, we've launched a, a trend following fund. So trend following is uh, is a strategy that we um, it's a, an important strategy for our alternatives firm, which is essentially you know. Um, <laughs> buying when something's going up and selling it short when it's going down um, and uh, trying to do that over a, a broad swath of markets. Um, there's definitely been interest in that because um, rightly, because it allows you to capitalize on, on some upside, um, albeit more muted, and but also capitalize or at least at a minimum get out of the way uh, on, the, you know, on the downside. So that's an example of um, that's really focused on Bitcoin and ETH, although uh, for certain clients, I think we'll broaden it out. Just there's, there's not a lot of liquidity on the short side in some of these smaller tokens, as you guys know. Um, and so there's certain constraints there. But I think over time, trend following in this space, just like it is in alternative assets, uh, asset management is a huge, you know, it's probably 20% of the hedge fund industry, maybe 25, so, somewhere in that zone. So I'm talking about a ton of money. Um, and I think that that will apply to to these assets as well. And then for those investors who are investing in that, they're like, look, we invest in systematic trend following in our core asset allocation. And so maybe adding some digital assets would, would be an interesting diversifier there, which which it is. Um, we, we've had a lot of discussions about distressed credit. So when we were all speaking last, I had brought... Um, I had brought uh, a fellow by the name of Doug Wilson, who is um, the, one of the most knowledgeable people I know in energy markets, both in the markets themselves, but also direct investing in them, kind of taking energy companies through bankruptcy. He's lived through tons of, well, tons, multiple cycles. He's not as old as I am, but he's, you know, he's somewhere between you guys and, and I. And um, I brought him on to just understand everything there was about Bitcoin mining, because I figured if we don't understand, that's just foundational. It's kind of like, how do you invest in asset markets without understanding Fed policy? How do you, you know, like you need to understand the right foundational pillars for any market to really understand it. And so he came in, he looked at it. Um, he, it was pretty cool. He, he's like, let's just go and buy some miners. We bought them. I think we paid the absolute high. I don't know. Maybe we paid 17 grand or 19 grand and, you know, shipped them from China or somewhere. And we, you know, we plugged them in everything. And they're like, okay, Doug said, well, let's, let's just, let's send these to someone um, who can disassemble them and tell us what, what it actually costs to make one of these. And I think the number was something like 15 or 1700 bucks. And then he read a, he read a, an Intel uh, report that kind of had hinted that Intel's going to get in the space and break the duopoly. And so he, he came to me one day. He's like, okay, so here's, here's mining. Mining is basically Bitcoin mining is, is going to be a shale gas boom bust. And we're in the boom right now. And this thing is going to unravel in, in like historic proportions because unlike, unlike, uh, Nat gas and shale gas, those guys at least were forward hedging their, their production. In this case, the miners are actually holding on to Bitcoin because they're expecting to, to go up. And so, you know, that it's been a market that um, we we've talked to everyone. Doug is Doug and his team have talked to everyone in the space. Um, we're looking at all sorts of different distressed deals right now. There's some really attractive returns. I think some big institutions could even ultimately invest in mining facilities where they create some of their own Bitcoin as opposed to buying it and then hold that on their own balance sheet as a way to accumulate, you know, cheap, ass- cheap digital assets. So those are the things that, um, uh, that, that we're seeing, I think, away from, from our strategies. Um, I think they'll, you know, there'll continue to be money that goes into venture, although a ton of money has already gone in. And so I don't know that they need any more money. They seem like they have plenty of commitments. And then trading strategies, you know, Brevin, um, Brevin Howard is, has a 25% uh, passive stake in our firm, um, and they're a you know they have a terrific digital um, business and and fund. And I think there'll be investors who probably invest in that multi manager kind of higher frequency trading approach, or however they define their 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 strategy. It's not just that. I think it's a a really 
a good investment product. But I think there'll be investors who do some of that kind of stuff, some trend stuff, some you know distressed credit, and then there'll be ones who invest in um, in uh, our index. So you know that there, I think investing in a well structured index that you know dodged Luna, dodged FTT, for instance, is a pretty attractive proposition for a firm that's taking an agnostic view to how this is going to play out. They're not Bitcoin maximalists. They don't necessarily think ETH is going to take over the world, but they think that these technologies will lead to a lot of value creation. And having a, a dynamically managed index, which means that its composition changes over time, will just mean that if they make an allocation to that, they're going to participate in the thing that really takes off if it's something that's very obscure right now or not even public in a way. So those mm-hmm. are those are the interests right now. It's a really smart way to tackle this market, I think. Yeah, the the investor in me thinks that that's a really fun job, actually, to be able to manage a portfolio that uh, captures all of crypto, yet still man- it manages to miss uh, the unsustainable stuff like Terra Luna. That sounds, that sounds pretty fun. Eric, as we uh, wrap up to a close here, uh, of course, all of in- institutional appetite into crypto is really going to determine be determined by macro. Macro, macro, macro is kind of the uh, the dominating. Uh, it's in everyone's brains, really. Uh, we've all learned in 2022 how important Fed interest rates and macro, the macro environment really is. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering just what, overall, what what is your take on the macro outlook for 2023 and how important is is the macro story as it relates to investor appetite in, in crypto assets? I'm wondering if you could just, uh, uh, as we wrap up this conversation, tie a bow on this with the, the macro conversation. Sure. Uh, you know, last year was historic, right? In terms of the scale and pace of, of that tightening, we walked into the beginning of the year and very little was priced in. And then we, you know, we finished the year and it, and it was just an extraordinary rate hike cycle. Um, and that surprised you? Yeah. I, I mean, I thought rates were going higher for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, the pace was, uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't expect it to be that high. Actually, I'll tell you, um, stories are always a little bit more fun. Let me tell you a story because this will, will encapsulate the, the macro view as well. So probably sometime shortly after last time we spoke, I was at one of these um, um, CIO dinners and uh, I was the, I think I was the only CIO at the dinner. There were probably eight of us that wasn't a billionaire, um, which I'm not ashamed to say, but you Yet. know, whatever. Yes. Uh, like give you a sense for the crowd, right? And so um, I naturally was, well, I was probably invited by the way, uh, because you know I was the one who'd made the most um, obvious commitment to these assets. And so um, one of the total legends in our industry uh, took it upon himself to um, be, I would say verbally abusive, but like we, we took each other on over our views, which I'm, I, I tend to do. I, you know, I don't really like sucking up. Um, <laughs> and, and, uh, even if other, if other people kind of can't help themselves, I, I'm like, what, what's the point of going to a dinner if we're not going to really kind of, you know, throw talk some about punches? anything. So, right. Exactly. So it. anyway, <laughs> so we spent the whole dinner, uh, it, you know, really combative. And, you know, most of these guys really were, um, unknowledgeable about, these technologies, these assets, et cetera. And they, you know, and they don't need to be, right? I mean, they're like, they, they got nothing to worry about. They, their businesses are amazing. They're running huge amounts of money and they've been incredibly successful. And they're kind of like, if, if it gets big enough and I have to worry about it, I'll worry about it later. I'll hire the right people or I'll acquire the right teams. But we get to the, um, so this, the legend who was kind of the, the, the grandfather around the, the patriarch of the table. Um, so, I thought he was really anti my position. And my position was, look, I think that the policymakers have made a proactive choice to debase the dollar and unburden themselves from these huge debts that we've incurred as a society and the entitlements that we have promised to our elderly. And it's not that inflation solves all of those things. It's that coming to terms with those two things, the entitlements and the debt, while rebalancing the economy so that it can be dynamic again is extremely difficult. And you're definitely not going to get there through austerity. You're not going to get there through tightening and putting the screws on and creating a depression. You're only going to get there through some combination of monetary abasement, debasement slash inflation, um, which means running high levels of nominal GDP for a long period of time with lower interest rates so that you know the real interest rate is essentially negative. And you're just going to pray for innovation. And that innovation could be um, 
It could be AI. It could be nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is not around the corner. AI is kind of creeping up pretty fast. So like as a policymaker, you're just praying for human innovation because that's not coming from government directly. It might be supported by government, but that's that, that's my position. And so I was like, look, I think that the decision's already been made. I agree that there will be a rate hike cycle, but it's it's we're we're not going back to the years of two percent forever inflation. Okay, like that just not, is not. I'm telling you that the the probability of that is is de minimis, and and the choice has been made, and so they will. Okay, they'll hike, but. They're not. They're not going to get. They're not going to drive us into depression to kind of reset the system at two percent because at two percent doesn't work anymore, right? That's that's why we got ourselves in that in this position where you, where post COVID you had to put all this money and you had to do all this QE because we were out of balance, right? So so anyway, that that'd been my position, and so this guy had taken issue with like everything that I was saying more or less, and then at the end of the dinner he's like, okay, so he kind of stopped conversation. He goes, okay, so. So let me just make a prediction here, okay? If Eric doesn't get stopped out, he's making all the money. Like that's what's going <laughs> to happen. So he's like, the Fed is going to hike. It is going to be more than you think because every Fed governor that we speak with, you know, is his signal that they're deeply uncomfortable with how loose policy is. So these guys are going to hike rates, okay? And then the economy is going to slow down. And Eric is right. Like there is no, there's no way out of this smoothly. So it either they will overdo it and they'll then they'll, we'll have to have a huge stimulus or you know they'll they'll come up with something different but then they'll start easing again and so I think that that's really the I think that that's the right lens through which to look at this I don't know if I will make all the money everyone around there is going to do around that table is going to be very very well off for many generations um, but I do think that the framework of thinking that's like look we had to get through the tightening cycle and then. We're not done with the, the tightening cycle. I think what we heard from Powell today was that we're now moving to 25 basis points. Maybe he'll skip a meeting here or there. It depends on what happens. Um, but I think crypto, you're already starting to see the you know the foot that's been on on crypto's neck just kind of eased off as we're getting toward the latter part of this this tightening cycle. So I think this will be a transition year. There are a whole range of of wild cards. There always are. I mean, like. Ukraine hasn't been settled. China reopening hasn't been settled. I think there, you know, there are. We haven't yet seen what investors do when they start getting nervous about stocks. If they do, by the way, and they they look at you know short term interest rates that are really high, and then maybe they park their money there. So there there are a lot of things that could happen here. But I think um, I think everything moves in a cycle. And we talked about maybe it's a good, good place to end on cadence. Like we're at that stage in terms of the cadence where not only we got through all the kind of crypto specific problems, but we're, we're through the, the really dramatic rate hike part of the cycle. And uh, I, think, I think things are more favorable. I don't know that that necessarily means that we're right back to a big bull market. I kind of open-minded to anything because I think cadence wise, we've done an incredible amount of work to get people to utterly capitulate in this market. So it could be, you know, like it, we could be in a, in a sustained bull market now. Um, so, so anyway, those, most those are the of the thoughts. tightening has been done. There still might be some ahead, but most of it's been done. Even in that world, we're not returning to a 2% inflation rate. We can expect more kind of debasement over, over this decade. And we'll see this in various forms, stimulus, maybe, maybe other sorts of forms. That's your base case for, the 2020s. Yeah, absolutely. I think we'll, I think in a decade when we're all, um, when uh, you guys still won't even, well, you'll be more than half my age, but like, you know, in a decade um, when we're having this conversation again, I think um, when you, you look at the CPI index, it will be a lot. It will, it will have moved at a pace that's, um, that's well in excess of its historical, you know, one and a half, two percent kind of grind. So the dollar's always depreciating, right? I mean, we are there is for as long as we've had the dollar, there has been monetary debasement. The only thing we're talking about is the pace at which it is debased. And so, and by the way, sometimes people use that term in a derogatory way. I don't. I'm just. It's just a. It's like I don't know. The sky's blue. The dollar goes down over time. It's just how the system works. It kind of lubricates everything. It's fine. There are periods in history where it goes down at a faster rate than other periods in history. Hopefully, it doesn't come 
completely unwind. I think what what happened this past year was the central banks looked at it and they they just said, oh my God, if we don't do something, we could actually have a hyperinflation. We have to regain some credibility. So they've been working hard to do that, but they're not, they are not going to throw us into, you are not going to solve the economic challenges that that this country is faced with, with our debt, our need to invest in things like green energy, sustainability, you know, reshoring our industries, rebuilding our military. By the way, like our, I was just looking at it today, our, um, our interest payments this year are basically the equivalent, they're forecasted by the CBO or the treasury to be equivalent to our defense spending. Like, so we, you know, and, and that money we're not going to get out of those debt payments through austerity. We're going to we're going to have budget deficits that accommodate all of that money that needs to be paid in interest on our debt, which keeps going up. And like that, that's how you just you keep getting more and more money into the system. So I think that 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 will be the story of this decade. That's the the big big theme of this decade. And historically, when governments have done that, there's been a lot of volatility because you don't like you don't go from this two percent flat line to it's like okay now we're just going to go to we're going to pretend we want two, but we're going to accept two and a half, and it's just going to be like that. It's it's like it's all over the place. Um, so that, that I think that's it'll be really exciting. I think it'll be great for crypto ultimately, and um, and there'll be lots of lessons, Ryan, for um, for all of us trading and uh, all of your listeners, you know, punting around in markets because it'll it'll you know it's going to be tricky, but it'll be fun. A lot of ups and downs. Debasement yeah. as the base case, and uh, yep. I hope you told the billionaire sitting around that that table all about the story of crypto. And the and the work that you're doing, I'd I'd love to sit in in one of those conversations and, and hear what they really think about it. Um, as always, Eric, this has uh, been so much fun getting you on uh, on Bankless and, and regrouping. It's always nice to talk to someone from uh, Greenwich. There, <laughs> you guys do such great work. I I, uh, I I love listening to uh, to to your pieces. I, I enjoyed your uh, your kind of top ten ideas uh, recently. And uh, yeah, I mean, they're just so, you just like, you're gonna have. You're going to have years or long, long time of all sorts of new, interesting things to talk about. So um, thanks for all the good work that you did. There was a time, Eric, when I was worried Dave and I wouldn't have enough content for a podcast on a weekly basis. <laughs> that was the first thing Ryan told yeah. me when I said, Ryan, we need to start a podcast. He's like, what are we going to talk what, what about? Gonna I've talk got about, about five <laughs> episodes in and then what? And here we are. <laughs> so I, I had the same. 400 like, episodes <laughs> in, yeah. Yeah. When I started writing, I started writing my weekly piece uh, in 2010 and I remember Sometime later that year, being like, I literally, I'm out of life experiences to kind of <laughs> talk about no. and triangulate. And I, there's, you know, but yeah, stuff just comes up, man. It's good. That's true. It's good. Well, it becomes, it keeps a, you sharp. It becomes a compulsion and addiction. Maybe that's the, the stage uh, David and I are in with podcasting. But uh, Eric, <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Action Thank you. items for you, Bankless Station Nation. You can listen to our last episode with Eric. This is episode 89, Why Institutions Are Bullish. Uh, go catch that back in the archives. Also, we'll include a link in the show notes to One River's digital assets research section on their website. That's where I was talking about uh, some of the material that uh, that we mentioned this call. Of course, got to end like this. None of this has been financial advice. How dare you think it is? Uh, crypto is risky, as always. So is ETH. So is Bitcoin. You could lose what you put in. But we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the Bankless journey. Thanks a lot. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anythings, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.